We're going to have a uh, kind of a case study regarding our attitude toward God and His Word and our obedience to Him. Many of us have lived long enough to have read some pretty startling headlines in our day. I don't know, is there anybody here that uh, remembers or was there when the headline said Pearl Harbor was bombed? Anybody? U.S. declares war. Roosevelt dead. How about President Kennedy assassinated? Yeah. How about the Twin Towers collapse in a terrorist attack? Yeah. None, however, could have been much more startling at the time than this headline, which could have headlined the newspapers had there been such at the time. During Old Testament times, it said, God rejects king, prophet says. Several facts would have made this startling. And uh, I'm going to be looking at 1 Samuel if you'd like to be turning there. First of all, God himself had chosen Saul to be king in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1. And Samuel himself had been chosen to anoint him. To God, declaring God's rejection of him. And secondly, King Saul had just accomplished the mission for God to defeat the Amalekites in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 2 and 3. And then thirdly, and perhaps most startlingly of all, King Saul had just revealed to Samuel his intention of making a sacrifice to God. 1 Samuel 15, 21. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 14, God had made a vow and he told it to Moses and he said, I want you to make sure that Joshua hears this. I will utterly put out from remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And so let's turn the pages of history back a little bit now, a few chapters. Moses had been sent to deliver God's people, Abraham's descendants from Egypt. They had escaped through the Red Sea and the Amalekites were a fierce nomadic tribe who inhabited the land between Egypt and Judea. And they refused to allow Israel peaceful passage through their territory. Israel had to fight. You remember that uh, Joshua went up on a hill and as long as his hands were raised then uh, God's people were winning the victory and then as he got tired and his hands went down then the battle turned against them. And so they set a stone for him to sit on and Joshua and Caleb sat on each side and held his arms up. And they held his arms up until Amalek was defeated. But the story doesn't end here. After the selection of a king, God sent the Israelites to do battle with them again. He said, now's the time for me to fulfill that vow that I made earlier because they refused to allow my people to come through their territory and they had uh, an unprovoked attack on God's people. And after this in 1 Samuel chapter 15, if you're there, verse one through three, Samuel said to Saul, I'm the one that the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people. So now listen to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men, women, children, infants, cattle, and sheep, camels, and donkeys. And then Saul carries out God's commands, chapter seven, I mean, verse seven. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, to the east of Egypt. He took Agag, the king of the Amalekites alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. 
But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the cattle and the fat calves and the lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. And then in verse 10 through 23, then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I'm grieved that I've made Saul king because he's turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was troubled and he cried out to the Lord all that night. And by the way, I'm really impressed with that verse. Evidently, Samuel felt a really close relationship to Saul. Uh, then early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. And then Samuel said, what then is the blading of sheep in my ears? What's this lowing of cattle that I hear? And Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. Stop, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy these wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them until you've wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on a mission, the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. And the soldiers took the sheep and the cattle and the plunder and the best of what was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Israel. You know, I find it somewhat difficult not to sympathize and feel some pity for Saul. I go back and think about where he came from. He had not campaigned to be the king. He had not even desired the office. God had chosen him. He had been a valiant warrior for God and for Israel. And some disturbing questions arise. Exactly what had Saul done that was so sinful? And if we were there, and if we were, or there were a situation perhaps in some way similar to that today, I wonder how we would feel about it. Did he not say, I have performed the commandment of the Lord? He thought he had obeyed the Lord. And so that brings some questions to mind. What does it mean to obey God? And is exact obedience necessary in every circumstance? So let's go back and look at this narrative a bit and see if we can find some clues for answers. First of all, we see that Saul did not, as we obviously can read, did not obey God exactly. If you compare chapter 15, verse three, he said, do not spare them, put to death men, women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camels, and donkeys. Don't leave anything alive. Completely, utterly destroy them. And then in verse nine, but Saul and the army spared Agag, the best of the sheep, cattle, fat calves, lambs, everything that was good and they were not willing to destroy them. And so it's true that he did go out to fight the Amalekites, but within the command that God had given, he had been given some really specific instructions which Saul had chosen to overlook. And so I draw a summary from that, that he attached the amount of importance to God's command which he felt was necessary. He tempered God's command with common logic, with what he felt like was the best thing. And Saul's evaluation of his mission was, I did perform the mission of the Lord. And Samuel's reply then was, well then what is the blading of the sheep and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? But you stop and you think, 
And I, I can't say that I know all of Saul's motives, but I think that he really thought that he was obeying the Lord. He had good intentions. And even the ones, even the, the things that he spared, he was going to sacrifice them to the Lord, right? And then Samuel's reply in verse 22 and 23 is the key to this whole thing. It's the message for us. Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. That's your punchline. To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed, to listen, is better than the fat of rams. And then he makes an application, broader application. For rebellion is like the sin of divination. And arrogance is like the evil of idolatry. Because, and here's the summary of how God saw what Saul did. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. That is the key to our understanding of why God preserved this incident for us and what God wants us to understand and take away from this. And we see that Saul had not learned the really important lesson. And that important lesson is that obedience to God is the only acceptable response of man in God's sight. No amount of good intentions or reasonings or and our sacrifice could excuse his disobedience. And so Saul stands before us as the type of people who profess to be Christians and who want to appear to be Christians in our actions, but nevertheless, we follow our own ways. And we see that even today, that there are people who talk the talk and sometimes they're even really super spiritual about it. And they talk about how they're following God and how God has led them and how God's never let them down. But they're doing exactly what they want to do. And they're not really following the commandments that God's given us. And we see at least three outstanding lessons, I think, for those of us in the 21st century. First of all, when man gives preference to his own will rather than to the clear declared will of God, he's guilty of positive rebellion and stubbornness against God. The Pharisees were expert rationalizers, weren't they? You remember Jesus had a lot to say to the Pharisees and about their attitude about religion. In Mark chapter 7, beginning in verse 9, Jesus is speaking to the people and specifically to the leaders of the people. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commandments of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And anyone who curses his father or his mother must be put to death. And so that was plain to them, right? But you say that if a man says to his father and mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is korban, that is a gift devoted to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down and you do many things, he said like that. And so whenever man gives preference to what we want, and we go our own way and we do what we determine we're going to do, just calling God in and saying I'm obeying God doesn't mean that we're obeying God, does it? And then a second lesson is that we must never substitute what we might call general obedience for specific obedience to God's will. Saul generally obeyed God. And he could point out a number of things that he had done that God had commanded him to do. And he considered this little small exception to be no big thing. It was just a minor thing. And something that he evidently was convinced that God would be pleased with. And you look at other people who have specifically obeyed what God has told us to do. For instance, Noah. Noah was instructed to build an ark that was to be constructed out of a particular type of wood. 
gopher wood. It was to have different rooms. It was to have three levels. It was to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. He was to bring in males and females of every kind of living creature. And I ask you, what if he had decided that he knew a better wood than gopher wood? Or what if he had decided that it, this wasn't wide enough, or this was too wide, or it was, wasn't long enough, or it was too long? What do you think would have happened to him? I think he would have perished just like everybody else did in the flood, don't you? In Genesis chapter 6, verse 22, it said, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. And the result was that Noah and his family were saved. And then perhaps a third and vital lesson that, is, that we can impress upon our minds is the paramount importance of God's obedience or man's obedience to God's command and how it affects man's relationship to God. Jesus himself emphasized the importance of obedience in John chapter 4, verse 34, whenever that his disciples had gone into Sychar to find some food for him and they'd had a long, hard, not just day, but several days. And Jesus stayed at the, the well to rest. We realize now that he stayed there for a different reason, or at least an additional reason, right? He had a meeting with somebody that they didn't know that they had an appointment with him, but he did. And a woman came, the Samaritan woman came. And after that conversation with them, his disciples came back and saw him talking to this woman. Then they observed it, and then they came to him with the food that they had bought, and they encouraged him to eat some food. And he said, I've got some food that you don't know anything about. And they looked at one another and said, did somebody bring him some food? And Jesus said, my food, you remember what he said? My food is to do the will of him who sent me. What, what energizes me? What keeps me going? My food is to obey God. That's the focus, the central focus of my life. And if that was the central focus of Jesus' life, I suspect that we might take an example from that, don't you? In John chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus said, For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And so Jesus himself, as always, is our example of what it means to obey God. And then concerning our obedience, if you'd like to turn to a passage or two, John chapter 14, John 14, verse 15. And notice what he connects to obedience. John 14, 15. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And then look at verse 21. Whoever has my commandments and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. And then look at verse 23 and 24. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him. We will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words that you hear are not my own. They belong to my father who sent me. You notice what he connects to obedience? It's really easy to say, I love God and I'm following God and all, whatever you want to say. But there's one ultimate proof if you love God. And that proof of obedience is the same reason that God loves you in the special way as his child. Look at John chapter 15, beginning in verse 10. He says, if you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I've obeyed my father's command to remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My commandment is this, love each other as I've loved you. Greater love has no one than he lay down his life for his friends and you are my friends if you do what I command. And you notice 
what he's connecting to obedience. And then in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but what? He that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And then turn to one more passage here in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Beginning in verse 46. Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and put them into practice. He's like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundations on the rock. And when the flood came, the torrent struck that house, but it could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. And so I suppose the, the application to this lesson is as we look into our own lives and we look at our relationship to God, we look at our relationship to his word, we look at our relationship to the commandments that he's given us to obey. Am I obeying God today? Are there reservations? Are there things that I have done that I have placed my own reasoning within God's commandment and consequently changed that? You know, I think it's a really sad reality that unpunished disobedience leads to tradition. Do you get it? Unpunished disobedience leads to tradition. That's why each individual Christian has a responsibility to constantly read our Bibles and check ourselves and our lives and our practices by God's Word. Look how this incident affected Paul's life. Saul's life, excuse me. Do you realize it's kind of hard to go back and get the time frame, but as I look at it and understand it, after this incident in Saul's life, he had 13 more years to live. And if you go and look at what his life became after this incident as opposed to before it, this single incident destroyed his life. And you look at what, how his, the rest of his life was spent, 13 years longer, 13 years of paranoia, 13 years of pursuing David, 13 years of feeling the guilt and thinking back on that incident that he had substituted his will for what God did. He surely must have had some serious, serious concerns about how did this all happen and why did I not listen to exactly what God said and do that but his life from that point on was destroyed even not only did he try to take David's life he tried to take his own son's life it destroyed his family it destroyed his relationship to God it destroyed his conscience and from that time on he's a completely different man and so, just in this little incident that we read about, this single incident that we read about in the Bible, the emphasis is on, let's not substitute our thinking for what God has told us. If God tells us to repent and confess our sins and be baptized, then are we going to substitute something for that? Are we going to do exactly what God tells us to do? And if, and if he gives us instructions of how to live beyond that, and we temper those with our own reasoning, and there are certain things that he teaches us in his word to do, and we decide, well, that's not really what I want to do. I want to do something different, and we do something different. How can we expect the consequences to be any different? To obey is better than sacrifice. And coming to church and giving money and taking the Lord's Supper and whatever else you pile on top of that, 
does not make up for disobedience to God. And so tonight, as we think about this incident in Saul's life, I want us to take away and think about this week. Are we, are we reading God's word? And when we find something that conflicts with what we're doing in our life, that maybe we're not doing what the Lord says, are we changing our lives to bring in an alignment with what God tells us to do? Think about that while we stand and sing.